This video is sponsored by THQ Nordic. If you haven't heard of Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign or Co2, it's pretty much a bunch of different strategy games smushed into one. You have the Total War-esque campaign and ballot management, you have the production chain similar to Anno, you have a ton of victory points to work towards like Stellaris, and you have politics and families like Crusader Kings. And despite all of these being different games and this all sounding like a mess, it's actually pretty fun and not actually horrifically hard to pick up. Don't get me wrong, it's still a strategy game, so you're not going to drop straight in and know what you're doing in seconds. Well, unless you watch this video. But before we get into how to actually play the game, we first have to get the contractually obligated stuff out of the way. Take it away, sexy deep voice man. Thanks, Colonel! Knights of Honor 2 Sovereign is a grand strategy PC game that is out now on Steam. The game features single player as well as online co-op or PvP game modes, so you can rule the world alone. Bring up the five friends along to help or crush them under your boot. There are mechanics for religion, diplomacy, city development, and more. Meaning you can play your way, all without becoming overwhelmed or confused. You have over 200 kingdoms to choose from across Europe, North Africa, and Asia, each with their own playstyle and unique units. Thanks again to THQ Nordic for sponsoring this video. Now back to the Colonel. Thank you very much for that sexy deep voice, man. So like I said at the start, this game is a blend of a bunch of aspects from a bunch of different games, and despite that, it's not actually that hard to pick up. I mean, just look at me. I'm an idiot, and I managed to sit down for eight hours solid and play a full game, and I even got a win at the end. There are a ton of things to think about at pretty much all times, but first and foremost, you need to know your resources, what they're used for, and how you earn them. You can see all your resources along the top right of the screen, as well as your change every minute. Gold is of course your main currency, and is used for basically everything. It's used to upkeep your military, import goods, maintain diplomatic packs, fund knight actions, pay tribute to sovereigns, and you can also lose gold to inflation if you stockpile so much. So if this starts to happen, be sure to spend some to make the most of your cash before it goes. The good news is, it can also be earned from basically anything. You have base income to get you started, all of your lands and their buildings produce income, you can make money with trade, you can tax your population, and you get income from any vassals that you have. Next up we have books, and these are pretty much always earned and rarely spent on regular upkeep, unlike gold. They can be earned from your lands, buildings, and from certain knight actions. They're then spent on upgrading your knight skills and building certain buildings. Piety is your religious power and allows clerics to perform actions to help your kingdom. Also, when it is at max capacity, you get a small amount of extra gold. So staying at full capacity isn't too bad a thing to do if you need some extra cash. It's earned from your lands and buildings, as well as clerics and their actions. Commerce is a strange resource since it's not really produced and consumed in the same sense as others. Instead, it works in a capacity-based system where earning commerce raises your capacity for actions that consume it. You can raise the capacity with your kingdom and buildings from religion and producing tradable goods. It can then be spent on trade deals with other kingdoms, importing and exporting goods and food, and expeditions which are missions you can send merchants on. Food works similar to commerce since you don't have any capacity, at least not in your kingdom. Instead, you produce capacity and then can consume that capacity for different things, and is of course produced from the kingdom and buildings, and is then consumed by exporting food as well as army and garrison upkeep. Finally, kingdom levies is the number of men ready to be mobilized as soldiers, so it affects how many units you can recruit. You earn levies in your kingdom and buildings, and being at max capacity earns you a small amount of extra gold. It is then of course spent on recruiting units, and more elite units need more levies, so it can't hurt to have a high capacity later on to build armies quickly. Now you know what resources you're working with, we can get into exactly how you can use them to improve your kingdom. Every kingdom is split up into towns which rule over a province. In these provinces, you have a number of settlements, features, and goods which determine what that town's production baseline is. Now you can't control what settlements, features, and goods a town spawns with, but you can then capitalize on these with buildings. This all sounds really complicated, but it boils down to this. For example, if you have a town that has a lot of village settlements, you can then build things like housings and village militias to get a lot of extra bonuses because you have a lot of villages. If you hover over each building, you'll see what bonuses you get for each settlement type. So in this example, building merchant skills will get us two gold and commerce per village. So we should build it here rather than a food market since we have no farms or monasteries. It's worth noting that these settlements don't lock you into what you can build. So if you want a barracks for recruitment, but you have no castles, you can still build it and make full use of the main effects like recruitment. You'll just miss out on the extra levies that the castles will get you. Features and goods are a little different to settlements. Instead of buffing the default buildings, they instead unlock new ones that appear along the bottom. More often than not, these are worth building every single time since they get you resources and effects that you might not be able to get anywhere else. A lot of these also allow you to produce tradable resources, which will then improve the value of any trading contracts you create, so it can bring in a ton of cash on top of any effects that the buildings themselves bring. 
Now on top of these basic buildings, you can also upgrade all buildings to improve their effects. And while this can be expensive, upgrading one building upgrades all buildings of that type across your entire kingdom. You can even see what the upgrade will get across your kingdom when hovering over each option. It's a great way to improve your output without getting more buildings. And it means that every new building of that type you make is going to be so much more effective right out the gates. Certain buildings and upgrades will require you to own a certain resource, like barrels or wine for example. These resources can be traded or made in-house if you have the right resources in your lands and the buildings to make the most of them. Generally, it's better to make everything in-house since you won't lose them if your trade partner takes a disliking to you, but if you have some strong allies, by all means, trade to collect them all. You never do know when they might come in handy. On top of buildings and regions, you also have to look over the kingdom and its people as whole, and this is done in the top left of the screen. These icons and numbers are the different classes of people in your kingdom and their opinion of you. This can range from negative 10 to plus 10, with a low number causing debuffs and a high number causing buffs, and these are different for each class. Keeping all these as high as possible will be essential to having a successful empire and will be affected by basically everything you do. If you get a lucrative new trade deal, your merchants will like you, but if you lose a critical battle or fail to defend your lands, your army will dislike you. Certain knight actions can also affect this, so keep an eye out for any opportunities to bring these numbers up for max rewards. You also have stability to worry about, which is affected by a large number of things like your kingdom's traditions, skills, opinions of your people, and much, much more. All it really affects is how content your people are and if they are likely to rebel. Just keep it as high as possible and eliminate anything bringing it down to maintain control. Be wary of this during wartime, as too many long-lasting wars can quickly bring stability crumbling down. And finally, we have Crown Authority. This is pretty much how your people respect the crown and are willing to bend to its orders. It can be increased and decreased by various events such as war results, kings passing away and more, but you can manually increase it by paying gold and piety, but this should only really be done in emergencies or when you have the resources to burn. All this really affects is income from taxes, stability and espionage defence. Now having all these towns under your control producing goods is all well and good, but not if there's no one at the helm. Knights quite literally keep your kingdom moving forward and without them you're going to be in a lot of trouble. They can advise you on every decision you make based on these little thumbs up or thumbs down symbols when something pops up. These will give you a good idea about what's best for your kingdom and which people in it will be happy with each decision. The first thing they do, which tags onto kingdom management, is govern towns. Now this does a few things. First of all, it will make a town a royal land, which basically means they'll provide you with their full output of resources, whereas an ungoverned town will only provide you with 10%. Depending on the knight's class, they'll provide some extra resources depending on the settlements in the town. Speaking of classes, there are five to choose from and each has a specialization, making them perform certain jobs better than the rest. Marshals are your military leader knights, and that's pretty much their primary function. They can also govern towns and while doing so, travel across the map. So don't worry about moving them around and losing their governance. There is one other knight type that can lead armies, but we'll come to that shortly, but most of the time it'll be marshals and no one does it better. They can recruit up to eight squads and most of their primary skills are useful for battling, such as buffing certain unit types, income from battle, morale, and more. They provide extra levies for every settlement and castle in their town, so station them in towns with the most castles to make the most of their production. Next up we have merchants, and these are your main money makers, both in terms of the effects they have on a town and their abilities and actions they can perform. When governing a town, they grant gold per settlement and commerce per village, so towns with a lot of villagers are the way to go. They can later get skills that further improve these effects, so having them in your most populous towns can result in a lot of cash. As well as governing, they can establish trading deals between you and another kingdom. These cost commerce to upkeep and of course grant you gold in return. The longer the trade deal goes on, the more opportunities turn up with them being able to expand trade to make even more money, of course at the cost of even more commerce upkeep. They can also export food if you're producing a massive excess and your trade partner is in the need for even more cash. And finally, they can set up imports for food and other tradable resources, which can be useful in your production chains and building upgrades. Every now and then, they'll come to you with an opportunity for a discounted import on a certain good, so keep an eye out for the ones you need and snag yourself a deal if you can. Next, we have diplomats, and these are, of course, how you do most of your background interaction with other kingdoms. When governing a town, they produce commerce and food for every settlement, so placing them in populous areas can keep your kingdom rich and satiated. They also do a number of actions aside from governing. They can be sent to a kingdom to improve relations between the two, they can improve the opinion of the different classes within the empire towards the crown, and they can be sent to negotiate peace, which will increase the likelihood of a kingdom accepting peace in wartime. And finally, they can create defensive packs or invasion plans. These are pretty identical aside from the attempt. You form a pact to either all declare war on a target if they declare war on any of you, or plan to invade them and go all at war with them all at once. These will require gold to upkeep, and the diplomat will then search for others to join the pact to make it stronger. Most diplomat skills revolve around their actions, so you'll be looking at things like improve the relations faster, be more influential during actions and more. These are a great tool when trying to turn other kingdoms to your point of view outside of wars, and can save you a lot of time and resources you'd otherwise have to spend battling. Next we have spies, and these are a bit of a high risk later game knight. When governing they provide kingdom stability, espionage and levies per castle, 
and stability in gold per village, so going somewhere with plenty of both of these is the way to go. Similar to diplomats, their primary use is for actions rather than governing, and spies have a ton of them. Firstly, they need to be sent to infiltrate another kingdom, and this will set them up for a variety of options. They can ruin relations between the target and other kingdoms, reduce the populace's opinion of the ruler, they can help any captured knights escape, whether they're yours or just allied. Other schemes can also make themselves available, such as bribing or assassinating foreign knights. Bribing can open up more opportunities to use your puppet to your advantage, so experiment, especially against major threats, to see how you can throw them off balance. Other opportunities pop up all the time for spies to root out spies in your own kingdom, and much, much more, so keep an eye on them at all times. A lot of their actions often come with a risk of them being exposed, and if they are, they're normally tossed into a dungeon and they must either escape themselves or be broken out via ransoms. It's also worth noting that spies are quite a late game knight since most of their actions cost a significant amount of gold to perform and maintain, so don't worry about them until you're into the late game and have plenty of cash to burn on their risky actions. And finally we have clerics. These are the religious knights and they are possibly the most complicated since depending on your kingdom's religion they can do a massive number of things. First of all the basic catholics. When governing they produce books and piety and can later get skills to get them a bunch of bonuses if they control a lot of religious settlements. They can then perform a large number of actions based on the religion of the kingdom. For catholics they can bolster culture to push your populace to be more loyal to your kingdom, adopt population which lifts disorder in towns which is useful post-invasion, or preach Catholicism, which will convert a region to, well, Catholicism. There are also many events that can occur in relation to the Papal States, such as missionary trips to gather knowledge, aka get a load of books. There are also trips to improve relations with the Papal States. If your cleric is on good enough terms with these states, they can become a cardinal, making them far more powerful in pretty much all their actions. If they're a high enough level and have good enough relations with the Papal States, they can even be voted into becoming Pope. If this happens, the cleric loses their normal actions including governing, but gains a ton of bonuses. Other kingdoms will be more cautious in diplomacy versus your kingdom, since angering the Papal States is a surefire way to get crusaded. Your kingdom will also gain bonuses to culture and influence, as well as gold, piety and books production. You can also make requests to the Pope to call for crusades and excommunications. These can be refused, but there's a much higher chance than otherwise. Finally, there is a much increased chance that your provinces will lose all disorder and be converted to Catholicism. Muslim kingdoms instead have scholars, which can perform all the same basic actions, but also set out on journeys. These are long missions that require a little bit of upkeep, but with every town visited on the journey, there's the potential to earn books, faith, gold and relations with other kingdoms if you visit their towns. You can even be in with a chance of converting towns to your religion. Just be aware of sending them on journeys into hostile lands, as they can be imprisoned or even killed. Similar to clerics, they can eventually become a caliph and gain the ability to call jihads, which are essentially crusades of their own. And finally, kingdoms that have the pagan religion instead have shamans. These have the same strengths as clerics, but can also lead armies even without any martial skills. Shamans can also study other religions from neighbouring kingdoms to trade some piety for books, and they can also promote one pagan belief to grant kingdom-wide bonuses to a specific area of the game. Now of course, alongside knights running around you need a guy at the top, and since we're talking kingdoms, this means having a king to keep things under control. Kings function pretty similar to normal knights, but they are of course a lot more precious, so you want to be a lot more careful what you use them for. They can occupy any of these standard roles knights have in your kingdom, so can lead in battles, negotiate trade, or spread the faith of your people. If they die in battle or are imprisoned, it can seriously hamper the stability of your kingdom, so keep them as safe as possible to avoid dire consequences. It's also worth noting that whenever you pick any skills for your king, they will instantly be leveled to the max rank. So to start off with, investing all of your books into your king will be the best way to go to get the most bang for your buck. When you start a game, your king will be automatically selected for you and have a predetermined class based on your kingdom. But as kings do, they will eventually die and need to be succeeded by an heir. And that's where the rest of the royal family comes in. Your king will need to marry and produce offspring, which can then take over when he passes away. You can marry him to the princess of another kingdom to strengthen your bond and pretty much guarantee no hostility for the duration of the marriage. Make sure to do this early to ensure you have an heir in line before your king gets too old, otherwise your people will start to worry about the literal child ruling them. Once you're married, you just have to wait, and every so often a child will be born. If you have a boy, you'll be able to choose their class, then each time they age, choose skills for them to take into adulthood. When they become fully grown, you can summon them to your court to work as knights, which can be a great way to have max skilled knights very quickly, as royals get to the max rank a lot faster than others. When the king dies, his oldest son will automatically ascend, and the cycle will continue. Now if you have a girl, sadly they're just the tiniest bit useless, since it's like 1100 AD or thereabouts, and girls get it done hasn't really come into style yet. The most you can use them for is marrying them off to other kingdoms to strengthen relations and maybe get a bit of inheritance if they become a queen and their husband dies first. Of course, before you can marry anyone to anyone else, you need to know who's your friend and who's not. You can interact with pretty much every kingdom in the game right out the gate, regardless of distance. Just click on them and click on audience to see your options. Most of the time you have three. Offers, which allow you to gift gold, land, offer trade agreements, non-aggression packs, supporting wars, or a royal wedding between your king's offspring. 
Demands, which allow you to ask for gold, land, help of any rebels, them to join your war, or release your knights they have as prisoners, and declare war. Now it goes without saying that declaring war may drop that kingdom's opinion of you by just a bit, and you can see this on a scale on the left below the king's portraits, alongside any current deals you have with them. Other actions will influence this, and most of what we mentioned are pretty self-explanatory, with offers generally being positive and demands generally being negative. You can also, of course, influence your relations using diplomat knights, and high relations will make the kingdom more receptive to favourable deals for you. During wartime, diplomacy can also be used to reach peace in a number of ways. The most simple option is white peace, where both sides just agree to stop fighting without giving the other anything. You can demand tribute to extort them for land, gold, marriages, and even total vassalization. Or you can do the same for them and offer them gold, land, marriages, and become their vassal, though avoid this unless you have literally no other choice. When you are at war, you have a number of different actions you can perform to push the side in your favour, and pretty much all of the main ones are done by armies. Armies, as we covered earlier, are normally led by martial knights, and they are made of up to eight units. Units vary from kingdom to kingdom, but everyone has access to melee, ranged and cav units. Some kingdoms are stronger than others in certain areas, like the Mongols have excellent cav, and the English have great ranged. Just build a balanced army like 3 melee, 3 ranged and a couple of cav, and you should be all good as long as you build the best units you can in each tier. You can also add siege equipment to build armies, and it's normally used during sieges to wear enemies down faster, but it can also be used in battles for extra support, though some pieces need specific lord skills to be recruited. The main thing you'll be doing with these armies is plundering settlements. If you remember from the kingdom management, settlements are the places in every town that produce their base resources. And these are shown on the map as small collections of buildings or castles or fields to represent what type of settlement they are. When at war with another kingdom, you can right click on these with an army selected to move them in and begin taking on whatever defensive force awaits you before plundering the land. If you manage to completely plunder the land, you'll be rewarded some resources based on the type and level of that settlement. This will also take that settlement out of commission for a while, but eventually they'll automatically rebuild themselves, ready to be plundered again. You can also choose to attack the town directly, and this will put you into a siege. During a siege, both the attacking and defending armies will slowly lose troops as well as supplies and food. The defenders have meters for resilience and siege defense, and both will drop over time and once one drops below 50%, the attackers can move into attack and take the town upon victory. In either a plundering or a siege, armies can reinforce from either side. If two or more armies from opposing kingdoms meet, either at one of these battles or anywhere else on the map, they can battle each other. When doing this, you have the choice of auto-resolving, which will let the game work out who would win based on each side's power. Alternatively, you can lead the battle yourself, which does open the door to more tactical play the AI wouldn't consider, but can also lead to much more devastating losses if you fail to manage correctly. Now, if you really want, you can manually fight every battle you come across, but most of the time, to save yourself time, it's better to leave the easy wins to the computer and only manual battle when you absolutely need to. If you played Total War, you'll be familiar with the battle style, as it's a fairly simplified version of that. As we've just covered, you have your three main types of units of melee, ranged, and cav. These all work in a sort of rock, paper, scissors system. Melee are normally either spears or swords. Spears are stronger versus cav, but weaker versus melee, and vice versa for swords. Ranged are strong versus pretty much anything they can land a shot on, making infantry an easy target, but they are weak to being flanked by cav. And cav are of course strong versus ranged, but they're a lot weaker versus spear infantry. I realise that this probably got a bit confusing, so let me put it like this. Melee troops are more often than not just there to hold enemies still, so get the best defence troops you can, and you should be fine. Ranged troops will do the majority of your damage, but are weak if they get caught out in melee, so keep them safe from firing enemies, and they should do great. Cav are fast and great at taking out enemy ranged, so use them for this to keep your troops safe from damage. Your knight also appears in battle as a cav unit, so use them alongside the cav, but be extra careful to keep them alive, as losing the knight more often than not means losing the battle. Of course, this means you can try and snipe the enemy knight for a quick win, so look for opportunities to do so, and be sure to mark the lord as a key tag for ranged every time you can. You can also use any siege equipment in your battle, such as trebuchets and battering rams, so look for opportunities to get them involved for even more value. Battles also have victory points that can win you the day if they are all controlled by one side, so if you notice the enemy is out of position, move in some cav or other quick units for an easy victory. Siege battles are more or less the same, only now you have to worry about enemy towers and gates. You'll need siege equipment like a battering ram to open up gates, and then trebuchets to take out towers to give you a clear approach. After that, you just flood into the settlement as hard as you can, and either take them all out or capture enough victory points to get the win. So you've done it, you've mastered building your kingdom up, you have your dream team of knights, a perfect family full of boys, strong friendships, powerful armies, and some war victories under your belt. All that's left to do now is, well, actually win the game. Now you have three options. First is to paint the map and take over everyone by force or shrewd diplomacy. This will of course take you many hours to complete, so may not be the best objective for your first campaign. The second is to become elected Emperor of the World. 
This requires you to accumulate enough fame, which can be done from pretty much everything you do in the campaign. On the Great Powers screen, you can see your global rank for everything from finances to foreign affairs to military domination. Going up for this victory requires you to excel in every area of the campaign, so it's a great one to work towards to learn the entire game before branching off and doing some separate runs. Once you acquire enough fame, you still need to be voted into being the Emperor, and this requires getting the other great powers on side, which can be done by building relations with the other kingdoms and building a reliance on you with trade, protection and more. Just beware, before clicking claim victory, that failure to be voted in will result in a war between you and all those who vote against you, so be sure you're going to win, or be ready for a huge fight. The final victory option is to collect all kingdom advantages, which is essentially the economic victory. It requires you to collect nearly every tradable resource in the game to acquire these advantages. These are basically massive buffs to your empire, so getting as many of them as possible, even if you're not going for this win, it should be something to think about. Once you have all the advantages, you can just claim victory, and as long as you're not in any wars, the campaign is yours. And that should be just about everything you need to know to get off to a great start in your first Knights of Honor 2 campaign. Thanks again to THQ Nordic for the sponsor. If you want to check out the game, it's out now on Steam. And honestly, it's surprisingly fun. If you know me, you know I don't really love historical games, but this one just has something about it that I really enjoyed. If you enjoyed this video, consider leaving it a like and subscribe if you want to see more. We are hoping to hit 50k by the end of the year and we're in the finals days now, so I sure would appreciate the assistance. If you want to support the channel even further, you can do so by becoming a member on YouTube or a patron on Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shout outs at the end of videos like Henry took his spots at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters at one last thank you for watching and for now, I've been Colonel Damders, and I will see you next turn.